practice, but we have only 11 attendees right now, but it's increasing very rapidly. Uh, again, I'd like to welcome everybody uh, to our webinar today, our DAIC EU Talks, European Union Talks. Uh, we have a very special guest today, Mr. Esko Aho, former Prime Minister of Finland between the years 1991 and 1995. Uh, those were very challenging years because you, uh, Finland was getting ready uh, to become a member of uh, uh, the European Union. And at the same time, Finland's next door neighbor, the giant Soviet Union had just collapsed. So you could imagine what kind of challenging times Mr. Asko, uh, Mr. A Mr. Aho went, uh, Esko Aho went through. Uh, so welcome, welcome, uh, Mr. Aho. It's uh, truly an honor and pleasure to have you. Uh, I know you've been to Turkey many times, uh, but again, since uh, we have right now 134 participants. Uh, right. uh, it's amazing, you know, this, this internet technology. Uh, so, by the way, for all those participants who want to actually follow uh, this uh, webinar in Turkish, uh, uh, there's, a, there's, a, uh, there's a bar under your screens which says interpretation. And what you have to do there, it's rather ironic maybe, but you have to select Japanese, okay? Uh, and when you select Japanese, you will hear everything uh, uh, in English. Uh, you will hear everything. Uh, at that, well, the English will be translated to Turkish. Very good. So, Sayın Başkanım, Mr. Aho, with your kind permissions, can we ask our wonderful uh, musicians to start something? Göksajim, uh, maybe we can start with you. Göksajim, sen ne başlasak? Kanun namelleriyle başlasak. Ee, senin o aşk namelerinde sonra Minna Hanım'a versek e, sahneyi sonra baba oğlu dinlesek bir başlangıç yapalım bakalım ne dersiniz haydi bakalım dinliyoruz yalnız e, Göksel Bey mute'da Aydan Bey yardımcı olur musunuz Aycan Bey Göksel'cim bir saniye time out diyorum Heh. şimdi nasılız evet başlayabiliriz Artık. Haydi bakalım. Thank you, thank you. That was wonderful. 
And again, that was a way to open up our hearts, you know, so that we can build bridges, bridges of, of heart, soul, what I call. Gönül köprüleri kurmamız için Göksel'cim yine bize o naneleri yansıttı. Evet, evet. Ve ne demiş Mevlana? Aşk göğsümde bir ateş yaktı. Şimdi tüm yapmak istediklerim şiirler, müzikler ve bilge sözler. Duymak istediklerim, yapmak istediklerim. As we start a great philosopher 13th century, Mevlana Celaletun Rubi says, Love lit a fire in my chest. All I want to hear do now are poems, music, and wise words. So we start. We start. As we start, yes. Okay. Very good. Very good. Excellent. Uh, anyway. Uh, so, where is uh, Minna? Minna, now is the time for you. Now is the time for Kantene. <laughs> Kanun of Kanun of uh, Finland. Thank you. 
تشكر ادريم Thank you very much indeed. And this is again, uh, all those uh, musical, musical touches uh, coming to us all the way from, from Finland. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. And now is the time for the father and son. Yurdal ve Ozan. Yurdal Tokcan ve Ozan Tokcan. Let's see how they go. Yurdalcım, sahne senin. Ve Ozan'ın tabi ki. Teşekkürler, teşekkürler. Teşekkür ediyoruz. Başkanım, Nail Başkanım, bir şeyler söylemek ister misiniz? Şimdi, uh, we've listened to Kalum from Turkey, Kantele from Finland, and Uğut from Turkey again. And I'd like to wonder uh, whether our uh, dear president, President Dick, uh, Mr. Nail Olpak, would he like to mention a few words now? Uh, as an entree, you know, as an overture. <laughs> thank, thank you so much. Thank, thank you so much, Halil Bey. In fact, I don't have too much to say because I'm just a poor listener, but this is really a great mixture. Also, uh, having that Kantele from Finland side, uh, this is the first time for me to listen that. Of course, I know Göksel uh, Bey and Yurdal Bey, but uh, it, it was very interesting for me to listen uh, Again, wonderful. Well, starting, we starting just before starting a webinar with this wonderful atmosphere. What can I say extra? Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you very much indeed. Well, uh, Mr. Aho, I'm going to leave the floor to you. But uh, our topic is a very special uh, topic. And again, uh, Naibe, uh, it's wonderful to have you here uh, at the start of our webinar. I think this is going to be a very special webinar. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, education, technology, and innovation uh, at the dawn of the new normal era. And I know uh, Mr. Ao has a wealth of experience uh, in breadth and in depth uh, uh, from, from, from many years to come. And I'm personally also very interested in listening to him. But since we are 
uh, starting with education and uh, our, our, our participants have actually posed, have sent their questions in already and we pass it over to Mr. Ao last night and I want to thank uh, our Dave team, especially Mr. Ajahn Damala for bringing everything together for coordinating all the activities. Uh, majority of the uh, questions are actually uh, on the education side. Uh, what will happen to education? Uh, especially one uh, question uh, that was asked by uh, uh, Mr. Zainab Odorokya, who is actually the, uh, uh, the head of our European uh, Unions at Dake. And she said, there is a gap, you know, within the city and also uh, in the villages. How can we actually compensate for that gap? Okay. This is also very important. And, uh, you know, we have participants from all over the world, as I've told you, from, from, from, from Europe, from Finland, definitely, from Latvia, Estonia, from Germany, from England, uh, from Italy, uh, from the, uh, you know, from, from uh, many other countries, in, well, in, in Europe, I cannot remember them all, and from Spain, uh, and, and, and uh, thanks to them all, and also from the USA, from China, okay? Uh, so education is important for all of us. Uh, so therefore, uh, I think you're gonna address that. And when it comes to education, then uh, we talk about innovation, which is the creativity part of our intelligence. Uh, and, and technology is a way to apply all that knowledge. So what I'd like to do, I'd like to ask, uh, maybe to some kind of music, music from Göksel. Göksel Jim, mikrofonu açsan da, Şöyle bir kanun namelleriyle ben biliyorsun bizim e, bu iki çeşit zeka diye Mevlana'dan bir şiir var çok güzel bir şiirdir o e, onu onu icra etsek e, ben İngilizce olarak bunu e, sen çalarken orada e, icra yapsam e, e, Halil Bey may, may, may I just add one point before the survey starts unfortunately Please. you know I have an excuse for today I'm not going to be all together with you. I'm really unhappy about that. There is an overlap. So at around 3 p.m. or something like that, I have to leave. Really, will you please uh, forgive me for that? Apologize. No, we, we, we really appreciate your being here with us. We know that there's a very important coming up uh, after our meeting uh, and there's, a, there's an overlap there. Uh, Sayın Başkanım, çok teşekkür I'm the, I'm the moderator over there. That is the point. Yes, yes, yes. So you're most welcome, but but biz çok teşekkür ediyoruz katıldığınız için. Tabii burası ne kadar az ederseniz buradasınız. Biz memnun oluruz. We'll be delighted as long as you stay here. So we will start with this bit of canon music and some poetry from Rumi on kinds of intelligences, and and then we'll start with Mr. Aho. Is that okay, Mr. Aho? Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. Yükselcim dinliyoruz. Evet. Mevlana'mız başlamış asırlar öncesinde. Farklı zekaların olduğunu öğrenmeye başladığımız zamanlardan belki yedi asır önce. İki çeşit zeka ile başlamış. Arumi, about seven, seven centuries ago, before we started talking about different types of intelligence, like emotional intelligence, spatial intelligence, whatever. There are two kinds of intelligence. Two kinds of intelligence. One acquired as a child in school, memorizes from books and from what the teacher says. Collecting information from the traditional sciences, as well as from the new sciences. With such intelligence, you rise in the world. You get ranked ahead of behind others in regard to your competence in retaining that information. You stroll with this intelligence in and out of fields of knowledge, getting always more marks on your preserving getting always more marks on your preserving tablets. And Rumi goes, uh, Rumi goes. He says, there is another kind of tablet. One already completed and preserved inside me. A spring overflowing its spring box. The flesh is in the center of your chest. This other intelligence does not turn yellow or stagnate. 
It's fluid. It's fluid. And it doesn't move from outside to inside through the conduits of plumbing learning. The second knowing is a fountain head. A fountain head from within you moving out. Ve bizim Celaleddin Rumi'miz bunu söylemiş. Yayından fırlayan bir ok gibi demiş iki. Gözünüzün tam ortasında bir ferahlık. Bu zeka ne sararır ne de durgunlaşır. Akıcıdır. Akıcıdır ve öğrenme kanallarından geçerek dışarıdan içeriye doğru hareket etmez. İşte bu zeka içinizde dışarıya doğru bir kaynak gibidir. Doğru. So, ne güzel söylemiş değil mi Mevlana'mız? Daniel Goleman'ın Emotional Intelligence'ından 7 asır önce. He said these 7 centuries before Daniel Goleman wrote his famous book Emotional Intelligence. Before Daniel Kahneman won the Nobel Prize on Take the Pass as Low, where he talks about you know, one kind of intelligence, second kind of intelligence. So, efendim daha fazla Mr. Ahoy'u bekletmeyelim. Göksel'cim çok teşekkür ediyorum. Without further ado, Mr. Aho, with different kinds of intelligence, here's the flow. We will be listening to your wealth of knowledge with your intelligence and intelligences that actually the experience you've developed over many, many years, your global and worldly wisdom. Thank you very much indeed. Floor is yours, Mr. Howe, please. Thank you so much. I'm very pleased to join you. I'm sitting here at, at home. Uh, it's a bit uh, colder here in, in Helsinki or Espo than, than in, in, in, uh, in uh, Turkey. Uh, I'm writing a book just now. I'm, I'm publishing a book about the Finnish crisis uh, 1991. Uh, and and it's coming out next next autumn and uh, that's why uh, since last late last year i have been analyzing crisis i'm trying to understand what happened in finland early 1990s or late 80s and early 1990s and now i realize that that everything what i have been doing is very helpful when trying to understand what to do with uh, coronavirus and what what is going to have, uh, be the impact of this crisis uh, may i start with uh, with uh, few words about, about crisis uh, theory, very personal, very practical crisis theory. But before going to that, I'm, I'm going to use a quote, which is, uh, Halil, this is very familiar to you. You are using, uh, uh, using uh, poems and uh, you are using uh, music. I, I will use uh, sports as an example. And, uh, and uh, I know that uh, football is uh, very, very popular in, in in Turkey. We are playing football, yes, but we are even better in ice hockey. And uh, and this story comes from ice hockey. Maybe the best ever ice hockey player is uh, Evan Kretzky from Canada. And uh, and um, we don't know him as a philosopher, but I think that he he made a very important point from philosophical point of view when analyzing how to create a star in, in ice hockey. He was once asked, what is the difference between ordinary player and a star? And, uh, and his reply, he was replying in a very simple way. Good player, ordinary player, is play, uh, skating where the puck is, but uh, a star is skating where the puck is going to be. In the same way in football, uh, I, I always remember when I was watching the World Cup in, in Brazil and, uh, and quite often they are saying that, that the final between Germany and, and, uh, and Brazil was the most important game. It was not. It was actually it was a game between Germany and Ghana. And there was a risk that Germany will be dropped out already in the, in the early phase uh, and, and, uh, uh, and close it was uh, famous player Klose was decisive player and uh, and uh, he he he's because of his behavior or his performance Germany was able to a uh, finally to to to to to uh, clarify uh, to semifinals and then finals and and he was the oldest player in the German team 
maybe, maybe in the World Cup. But he was on the arena only less than one minute, or roughly one minute, and he made a very important goal. And the, the key for that was that he was, he was where the ball was coming to. And I, I think in the middle of crisis, in the early phase of crisis as well, you have to start thinking not only what to do today, how to act today, but to start planning for the, for the future. I think all, all crises do have a few similar phenomena. And um, for the first, this crisis is, in my opinion, black swan. If you have time, please read uh, Nassim Nicholas Taleb's book about black swans. He's, uh, he's uh, telling that sometimes we are going to face extraordinary difficult problems which are coming as a big surprise, unpredictable way. And secondly, they have a huge impact. And finally, afterwards, we are able to explain what happened and why it happened. I think the same is going to happen with this coronavirus. It came uh, as a big surprise. Uh, it has huge impact, not only economic or health and economic impact, but also social, social impact, which is going to be seen. And finally, uh, afterwards, we are going to, and already now we are able to explain why this kind of, uh, this kind of disease was able to, to, to be a, a global problem. But uh, well, there are several phases in, in crisis. Uh, first, we have to understand that there are actually, there is first part of the crisis when we are not taking things seriously yet. We have too much wishful thinking. And in the second phase, phase, when we are coming out of the crisis, we have too much negativity. We don't see all the opportunities of uh, recovery that is going to take, uh, take place. Secondly, uh, as we have mentioned already in the title of my presentation, uh, we are never coming back to normal. After the crisis, major crisis, we are never coming back to normal. We are moving to something new, which is, in my opinion, uh, easy to, to be called uh, new. For the third, um, the Chinese are saying, crisis to always have two, two hats. Having, having, destroying but at the same time, crisis is creating opportunities for something new. The fourth thing, which is maybe the most important of these, all these characteristics. Every major crisis is strengthening trends, strengthening trends. Trends which are going to negative direction or positive direction will be strengthened well, when a crisis is, is uh, <coughs> and finally, I'm going to speak about that uh, uh, in the latter part of my presentation. Finally, if you want to get out of the crisis, and if, if you want to get out of the crisis in a, in a positive way, you have to have a concept. And uh, <laughs> from the beginning, you have to understand that the existing concept is not the one you need to recover and to get out of the crisis. You have to change your... your, your so, so. Ali, yes, let's go. This is wonderful. Now, since we're doing this in an interactive way, you've yeah, set yeah. the stage. You, you, you, you've, you've set the stage now, that's lovely. Now, interactive way, uh, as uh, Mr. Opak uh, mentioned, he has to leave, but we'd love to hear his thoughts about this whole thing that's going on. Askenim. Şimdi interaktif yapıyoruz ya, biz biraz yaratıcı da yaklaşıyoruz çünkü konumuzda inovasyon da var biliyorsunuz. Onun için o heyecanla biz girince bir anda böyle müzik bizi aldı, başka bir diyarlara götürdü kabul ederseniz. E, ama tabii sizin de düşüncelerinizi duymadan bırakmayız size. Dolayısıyla rica etsek siz de bize bir görüşlerinizi paylaşsanız. E, so what we got, we got so excited with music, poetry and everything and with lovely people. So we are talking about innovation. We have to be creative and we're doing it in an interactive mode. So you've set the stage. We're going to let the audience think about what you said and we're going to let uh, 
our president, Mr. Nair Olpak, uh, to share his views, then he has to leave for that other uh, important meeting, and then we will continue, okay, to our, to our heart's content, as they say. Sayyid Bashkarim, Guiru Lutfan, with your permission, let's go, okay? Yep. Please go ahead. Please. Thank, thank you so much, Halibi. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Prime Minister. And welcome again for all uh, joining for this DQ Talks webinar. I believe we are uh, all brought here today online because of this global COVID-19 pandemic, which whether uh, we like it or not, but is forcing a new normal era upon us. It has and will continue to impact many aspects of our individual lives and our societies as a whole. We will narrow in uh, one uh, in, on three critical pillars overlapping for global progression, education, technology, and innovation, yes. As far as I know, globally over 1.2 billion children are out of classroom, an unprecedented challenge for our mother world. But very quickly, we saw how our modernity was able to adapt to this changed landscape and uh, in enters technology and innovation. From virtual classrooms to interactive apps, tech and innovation has been at the forefront of solving what could have been one of the largest disasters and fallouts from this pandemic, failing to educate our next generations. In Turkey, we responded by starting one of the most comprehensive distance learning operations globally, the state-sponsored EBA online platform, which will serve nearly 20 million stu students, is serving already. But the impl implications of COVID-19 still uh, obviously far outside of the classroom. Many believe this crisis will spark a much needed wave of medical innovation because Ultimately, the solution to this pandemic is medical, and the world is unity, not dividing in this search. During the most pessimistic of moments, mankind adapts itself even to the situation, seeks and finds a way out. I believe that we have adapted much better in terms of psychology and business than we expected and have created timely solutions. Innovation is also similar, even evolving and developing. In this process, some critical sectors that have strengthened their online infrastructure and invested in R&D are becoming prominent. If we find solutions according to changing situations all over the world, and Turkey is no exception in this space to find the best solution for people and business people alike. When I come to they, they, with our 146 country-to-country -country business councils, with an understanding of business diplomacy, we are aware that those who are capable in adapting to difficult conditions and those who can manage to keep the supply chain, who can give sufficient confidence to counterparts, will lead the change for a better world. While continuing our business, a human perspective must be at the core of innovation and education. We must, I believe, adapt this point of view to our business. It has to be the cornerstone of our education. We need to use this for the benefit of society despite all the neg negatives. Now, uh, Mr. Aho, a new formal perhaps will become to the regular way. Uh, the regular way, sorry, and uh, pay the way for new standards and methods, but also raises some questions. Are those lockdown measures and social distancing a limitation of freedom, or instead, do you think this works as a stepping stone for the next leap of mankind? I will continue with another few questions, uh, if you uh, leave me. We, uh, we say that the response to the virus has forced nations to close off and some commentators put forth that the pandemic might mark the start of deglobalization. This is another point. 
However, it's also becoming apparent that at the end of this crisis and any future issue similarly affecting all countries will require global coordination and cooperation. How should the leadership, local or global, I mean, be it governments, business or schools, be shaped to tackle such massive threats to the well-being of people without unfusing any fear in their minds and everyone motivated and efficient. What are some silver linings you see in this issue, if there are any, of course, that may become life-changing lessons for future generations? Of course, there are too many questions. Uh, thank you again, uh, Mr. Prime Minister and Chairman Halil Bey. I'm Enjoy going it. to be a little, sometime more with you. I want to hear more uh, from Mr. Prime Minister. Thanks yeah. again. And sorry again uh, that I'm going to leave when the times come without interrupting anyone. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you very much, Naive. Bey. It's been an absolute pleasure to have you. And again, uh, innovation. We are, we are innovating today with a different style of uh, meeting agenda. Uh, I think that turned out to be great that you're also setting the stage. And I think uh, Mr. Al, uh, Mr. Olpak has really helped us a lot because he kind of summarized most of the questions that were posed to us in a very nice and effective way. So thank you very much indeed. Uh, thank you very much. Mr. Aho. All right. So All right. It's yours again after setting the stage uh, and then uh, uh, Mr. Olpak has added a lot uh, to that landscape. Now we're yep. listening to you. And again, we are approaching over to, well, almost 200 now attendees, active attendees. <laughs> Good. I, I will answer that question uh, in, in, in, in my presentation. But before that, I'd like to say a few words about, let's say, foundation. Because, because as uh, President uh, of Dake said, uh, we have different aspects of crisis. We have a health care aspect, health uh, challenge, uh, medical challenge. We have an uh, economic uh, challenge. And then we, ha we are going to have a huge social challenge as well. That so social challenge is not yet there, but it's coming. We know that there are a lot of, lot of uh, people who are going to suffer from generational impact of this, of this uh, virus. And I think we have to, in order to fight against these uh, negative, negative uh, factors, we have to be able to collaborate. I, I, I, I'm very strongly in favor of global collaboration in this field. I'm not sure that that is going to happen on the short term. Maybe on the short term, we are going to have negative impact on the global arena. A lot of protectionism and, and uh, negative uh, consequences. But on the longer term, I'm confident that uh, countries, companies, individuals will understand that, that only together we are able to fight against this, this, this type of uh, crisis. But may I start before going to uh, innovation policies, may I start by taking example from Finland. As I told, I'm, I'm publishing books and this is uh, one, of the, one of the new ones I have, uh, I have uh, made. This came out when Finland independent Finland celebrated its uh, uh, 100th anniversary. It's uh, full of stories about, about Finland. Why one of the poorest countries in the Western world, maybe the poorest one, 1918, 1919, became one of the richest one within 50, 60, 70 years. The answer is, in my opinion, in the foundation of the society. And, and this foundation is still there. And I can see three main elements, how to create successful modern society, which is able to survive also this type of crisis. The first one is rule of law. We inherited rule of law from Sweden. We were part of the Russian empire for more than 100 years, but we were able to integrate ourselves as an independent nation into the Swedish legal system which was based on the rule of law. Secondly, trust in institutions, which is very, very important. I think everywhere in the world, people, even biggest companies have recognized that without competent, good governments, without competent uh, social uh, sectors, we are not able to survive 
uh, against this type of uh, crisis. We need well-organized healthcare. We need well-organized societies. We, we, we need also trust in institutions among citizens. And third, which is very closely linked to education. We need social mobility. Social mobility is the best guarantee that there is stability in the society. And education is most fundamental tool to get that social mobility. But we need also reforms in order to guarantee that people have access to, to prosperity, access to better life. And in these times, I think it's going to be extremely uh, relevant. So uh, this is how I, I see the, the background in, in, in Finland. Uh, what are the, what are the first, first of all, what are the major trends I can see now? So what, what, what is going to happen in the, in the, in the, in the, in the global economy now and uh, in, in, on the global arena, thanks to this crisis? I don't take these negative things because they are so obvious, but I, I'd like to start from, from trends which will be positive trends which will be strengthened. This is a good example of one trend. Remote working, meetings, online meetings. I do this every day. I have uh, participants from different corners of the world. I don't think that we are going to return back. Uh, I discussed uh, a couple of weeks ago with the biggest uh, uh, forest industry company in the world, uh, um, um, or, or CEO of that company, who told that they had a meeting in China that covered 5,000 customers and customers' customers. 5,000 people were included in, in, into one single online event. And he said that experience so, was so positive that they will never return back. So we are, we are learning that actually we have been speaking about remote working earlier, but the fact is that first now we have really started to move to that. Um, Mr. President, you mentioned already uh, educational area. I have a, I'm coming from, from a country which has been ranked very high in education. Finland is a role model for, for, for many, many, many countries. But the fact is that uh, we have had a lot of discussion about digital tools in education. And our authorities have said, we are so advanced, we don't need any special efforts, we are already there. But when we were forced to start remote uh, uh, education, we recognized that we are not there. But within a few weeks, it happened more than within the last five to ten years. So we, we were forced to take technological uh, applications into the use, and we were able to, to do that. I, I can see a lot of opportunities there. Do you know why? Because there is a revolutionary change able to be done in the educational system thanks to digitalization. And what is that? You can move from standardized teaching and learning into personalized one. If you look at the performance of the Finnish education system, one of the assets we have and one of the qualities we have uh, is that we are starting to have standardized testing very late. We are, we are actually having major standardized testing after the high school in the age of 19, not before that. And, uh, and, and in many countries, I think they have made a mistake starting to compare students to each others too early because students are different. Children are learning in different ways, in different phases. And if you start standardized testing too early, it leads to a situation that some dropouts are, are coming only because of the fact that you are a bit, you are majoring a bit later than others. And boys are suffering from that. Now we have finally a tool to personalize teaching. It means that you are not comparing a student to, to, to, to, to others, but to look at how his or her performance is improving. And we can do that. And I, I think it's going to revolutionize uh, education. And now we are starting to do that. Online sales, I don't have to tell you how much increase we have seen 
in many sectors in online uh, online sales that is a trend which is going to be strengthened as, as as well digital health i i'm very optimistic that uh, as you mentioned mr president healthcare innovation medical innovation is going to take huge steps because of this uh, this virus and i hope that this is also this is going to increase collaboration among among nations and among country uh, countries and among companies to get uh, good results artificial intelligence when integrated into the healthcare system it's going to revolutionize it it's not necessary to have more resources more money but you can spend your resources in a much much more efficient and smart uh, smart way uh, also in social networking we have uh, challenges i'm concerned about one thing these kind of tools we are using uh, we are fitting very well uh, for younger generations they are used to to use all these tools in an efficient way it's everyday life for young people to to use social media uh, to move to to digital remote services and um, working age people as well but we have more and more senior citizens we have uh, for example in finland we had uh, 50 years ago 15000 18 plus people in in the whole country now we have 150000 today and when i'm going to be 85 uh, 2039 we are going to be 340000 340000 so it's more than it's going to more than double in the next 20 20 years and uh, those people need also high quality services social networking opportunities and i i believe that that uh, daig and many other organizations in turkey have to start thinking about that in turkey as well because turkish population is aging as well this is a global phenomenon and, and we have to be prepared for for that so digitalization is one major trend which is going to be strengthened and it has started to strengthen already already now second trend which is not that visible yet it is uh, I, i'd like to call it circular bioeconomy we are we, in spite of the fact that oil price has come down uh, fossil fuels are less expensive than earlier i strongly believe that there is a trend uh, towards uh, uh, circular bioeconomy. We are using biomaterials uh, and, and we are using them in a sustainable way, uh, recycling them, recycling them, which is going to create opportunities to move to a sustainable economy. And Turkey has a lot of resources in that area as well. And I can imagine that if you ask, and you have asked me about opportunities between Finland and Turkey, I think we have a lot of opportunities in the field of digitalization, but also in the field of uh, using bioeconomy or, or uh, developing bioeconomy. We can be partners in, in that area as, as well. I will return back to this aging of population because that is the third major trend which is there. But also that will be huge opportunity for innovation on the, on the, on the longer term. Uh, we had a conference here in Finland uh, last summer. Uh, we called it uh, uh, Forum of uh, Silver Economy. We called uh, this uh, aging of society challenge as a challenge of uh, silver economy. And we use the phrase, silver is the next green. And if you compare aging and its imp impact in, in societies and economies, it's rather similar than the impact of uh, environmental risks. We know that societies are going to be changed and within the next 20 years, a lot is going to happen. We need a new type of social model. We need a new type of uh, economic model. And, uh, and we have to be able to adjust ourselves into, into that, which is going to create a lot of problems, but also huge amount of opportunities. And, uh, and I was surprised when I was listening to one professor in Helsinki last summer, he was say, saying that it's, it's, it's not true that efficiency is in decline when you are getting older. Productivity is not getting lower 
when you are getting older because you can compensate your physical physical physical uh, restrictions with uh, your experience and and the the the the, the, the group of uh, working population he was using came from car industry he had made a study in the car industry and recognizing that that actually the level of productivity among workers did not change according to the age which is revolutionary if that is true it means that we have good reasons to educate people to stay in the labor market longer and longer especially those who who personally want to do that then uh, may i conclude by saying a few words about about uh, uh, education and and and uh, specific uh, requirements for for for education the first huge challenge is uh, personalize everything we have to we have to learn using teachers in a in a different different way somebody was asking me is there any good uh, uh, models in the world i was a couple of years ago in singapore visiting NTU, Nanjing uh, Technology University, one of the highest ranking universities in the world. They had the, the, the, the most modern university building, huge building, seven, eight floors. And the biggest uh, room in that uh, building was uh, 40 to 50 square meters. No major big halls and rooms for lecturing, because lecturing took place online. Students were doing everything at home, uh, uh, remote. What was done in the, at the university was uh, discussion on the basis of this lecturing. So, so teachers were meeting in small rooms, their students, and discussing those topics. By the way, today, with these type of uh, tools we are using today, even that part can be done easily uh, uh, online. So you can first look at uh, look at uh, general uh, lecturing, and then you are coming with your teacher to this type of event. You can discuss. You can have a dialogue on the basis of that lecturing. So that is first first challenge: how to personalize everything. Second is that what kind of talents and skills digital society or economy or bio-based economy requires why it is so difficult to to get uh, digital healthcare for example to take place is it because of uh, because of uh, lack of uh, good specialists no it's not we have all the specialists we have all the technology what is missing is uh, good capacity of design. If you start building a house, what are you doing? Are you calling, are you calling uh, uh, construction workers, specialists on the site saying, that, please, here is, the, here is the material. Do a house, do, do, create a building on the basis of that. They cannot do that they are necessary to be used but first somebody has to make a design and who is able to make this design not a specialist but a designer architect architect who has enough understanding of different disciplines but he is able to to create design for the building in a way that all the specialists are able to work according to that i think when i spoke about new uh, concept. I think that is what we need now. Conceptual capacity to understand our complex problems. In bioeconomy, in digitalization, also in creating a new type of uh, society which is taking into consideration aging challenges better than the present society. I think we need more and more designers. And that is a major challenge for educational institutions. You, which, which are used to educate specialists. And even they are ranked according to their capacity to, 
to to to create good spe special capacities and skills i think we have to concentrate now rapidly into multidisciplinary training how to get designers not only for construction sector but designers for for everything what we do uh, then final thing is uh, risk taking capacity when we speak about innovation quite often we we are looking at uh, we are looking at uh, uh, how much resources we are spending for r d in specific sectors for example now china the united states and the european union are competing in the ai artificial intelligence billions and billions are spent for artificial intelligence is it a sector for turkey or finland to go to, to try to, to to to be part of that competition i don't believe in that our resources are limited what is possible for the us or china is not possible for turkey or finland and uh, the same with big data many other uh, components of digital life but what what is an option for us is that this horizontalization of everything so we can combine ai big data uh, good understanding of, uh, of different uh, sectoral things together and i think this is the secrecy of finland we have our economy has always based on the idea that we are able to combine different technologies in a creative way into into into one and and that requires risk-taking capacity and traditional financial systems banks are not good for that they are good for for traditional industrial investments they are good for consumer investments they are good for housing investments but they are not good for innovative changes in economies and societies because because that risk is is very difficult to be estimated if you put your money into new medicine or pharmaceutical for example you never know if something comes out of that traditional banking cannot invest in businesses like that the same with uh, many innovative solutions products and solutions it's very difficult to be to be done that's why we need venture funding and venture capital but also risk-taking mindset so that we understand that failure is part of the part of the game if you are not ready to fail you cannot win anything and in the present world it's very difficult to to take that that kind of risk because if you fail somebody is blaming you kicking you out you are you cannot take that kind of risk and that's why a lot of innovation will never take place because because it's only a question of risk, risk taking so i'm not that worried about technology i think technological pot potential is huge it's it's uh, there is much much more potential technological potential than capacity to take benefit from from that and that is a challenge for educational institutions and societies to to improve our capacity to take benefit of technologies and final final word this is where the buck is going to be this is exactly where the buck is going to be let's try to solve these health problems let's try let's let's try to assist uh, companies to survive over this crisis but simultaneously let's put our efforts to create a new concept how to assist economies and societies to develop with uh, the best technologies in the in the future this is uh, more or less what i wanted to say and uh, i'm very happy to take your questions and uh, comments thanks Ali. mr Ashraf. prime minister re really thank you thank you so much i i am really in a difficult position on the one side i should leave but on the other side believe me half of my soul will be staying here <laughs> it's a pity for me but at least I'm going to listen it again. You, you can do that and uh, feel free to contact me if you are interested to, interested to, to do. And I, I will send you a copy of this book as well so that you will, you will get it.
Thank you so much. It helps you to understand why Finland is, is doing like it is. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Harin Bey. Başkanım, teşekkür ediyoruz. Uh, Mr. President, Mr. Opak, thank you so much for your attendance and giving us the support. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Aho. Yeah. My dear friend Esko, we are here. Maybe we can be a bit informal now. Huh? <laughs> I, I have here uh, all the questions. I can I can take them, but if yeah. you have immediate reactions coming from... W would you mind... Uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm wondering whether the musician, musicians are still with us. Maybe we can have a touch of music, okay. a touch of Kantele maybe, to yeah. refresh uh, ourselves, like a little break. Uh, yeah. Aycan Bey, musicianlerimiz buradalar mı? Anyway, we can we can take the questions. We have a number of questions that uh, we wanted to address, uh, and a lot of questions actually on uh, on on uh, on education. I mean, uh, questions like how to duplicate Finland's success of education model, uh, and and and how about the how about the the, the gap, you know, yeah. and uh, all those kind of things. Uh, and what are your what are your suggestions? Where the puck or in our football, or where the ball is going to be, kind of stuff. And we have, here we have Minna. Minna, we want to listen to you a bit of kind of that, that your, your, the harmony of your music, okay? okay? Something to refresh our souls. What do you think, Mr. Howard? <laughs> okay, go ahead, please. Thank you. Kitos. Kitos to you. <laughs> Thank you to you. Some more traditional uh, melodies. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. So, no, I, I have to start by saying that this uh, Kantele is, uh, is uh, very famous in my, my home region. I'm born in, in a small municipality and actually the Board of Arms of that municipality is based on Kantele. So Kantele is there and a very famous Kantele player in Finland, let's say late uh, 19th century. She was she was uh, coming from my uh, my home region, so so I uh, I'm very happy to listen to that instrument. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we have one question actually, uh, and that question is, uh, what should be the strategic priorities in education in this new normal world? Yeah. We're talking about strategy, and and the new normal world. Yeah, I, I'd like to answer the the first question and this one simultaneously. The first question was how to duplicate the, the, the Finnish, uh, Finnish uh, model maybe elsewhere, and then how to, how to uh, change the, the, the, the education system. For the first, don't copy anything. I don't believe that when educational system has to be designed according to cultural backgrounds and cultural heritages. So, so you cannot take a model as such but you can learn a lot from, from other countries. So I think Finnish model is, is a reasonable model to be, to be looked at very carefully when making plans. But I think the, the, the major challenge in Finland is as well that, that the existing model is fine and it has worked nicely until now, but we have to be able to, to reform that rapidly. 
I'm extremely worried about, about dropouts. I, I think that the, the, the, the target, the, the key objective of the education system is, is not to have a maximum number of uh, super performers. But the, the, the, the basic objective, of, especially of uh, elementary education, is to give for each member of the society capacity to, to, to survive in, the, in a modern society. And we have seen that we have a lot of challenges in, in that area now, even in developed countries, even in countries like, like Finland. And I think the fundamental problem is this standardized model. Teaching is still based on standardized model. So that when I went to school in 1961, what we had? One class. We had one teacher and one book. And uh, what kind of uh, personalization it was possible to provide in that circumstance? Very limited. You were able to learn from teachers teaching or not. And for some people, it, it, it method was good, but for some others, it was not good. They were not learning and they were dropping out or le not learning fast enough. But in today's world, you can, you can start using different models. I have four children. And uh, when I'm looking at these four children, each of them are learning in different ways. And standardized model is, is not good for, for all. And that's why I think that we have to, we have to teach teachers and, and, and, and to get the role of the teacher to be changed. The role of uh, Singapore NTU professor or, or teacher is not the same as it was before. We can use the best lecturers in the world, but, but the teacher in the class is like a moderator. Teacher's role is to combine all the data and this social environment in the, in the class and to assist, assist children. Fasi Salberg is very well known Finnish uh, uh, teaching specialist or learning, learning or, or, or educational specialist. He has been at Harvard, uh, Harvard Kennedy School. Uh, I think now he is now in, in Australia. But, but, but we discussed about this and we are uh, Uber, this, uh, this uh, taxi service was, uh, was uh, brand new when we discussed and we were thinking that actually the role of the teacher is like operator of that system so that he or she is able to see where the students are moving and to guarantee that that they are doing well with uh, their own personal educational on their own personal educational track so that is in my opinion the the, the critical challenge when i went to school in that one single book I had everything I, I, I was able to learn without teacher. Now, when my grandchildren are, are getting to the school, they have all the data, all the information of the world in their pockets. So the, the critical thing is not anymore to teach all the data and facts, but to, to teach learning, developing itself, and to also to have uh, capacities needed in the, in the social, social life. Very good. There's another interesting question comes from a very good friend uh, from Finland. Uh, with his permission, I will mention his name because he's a dear friend. He's been supporting our activities all along. Mika Halton, uh, chairman of Halton Group. Oh, yeah. and it's very important because indoor air quality. And, uh, and, and, that, and I've been telling everybody that you were the, when you were prime minister, you were the youngest uh, prime minister at the age of 36 in Europe. And the question is, when you were a young PM in Finland during a severe recession in the early 1990s, what are you that are leading in? You know, what can you share with us? I mean, what did you learn during those times and that you can share with us? Uh, tough it, times, I'm sure. Very challenging times, you know? Yeah, they were tough times. I, I think it's, uh, it's important to understand that you are not trying to go back to normal, but you have to have understanding of, uh, of the new normal. And uh, I think the best thing we, we did, we made many mistakes as well, but the best thing we did 
when we had to cut uh, spending for healthcare, for social services, benefits, everything, uh, we had one single sector where we added resources all the time, year after year, in the middle of the crisis. We added investments in R&D. And we believe that, that in spite of the fact that we have now difficulties, we are coming out of this crisis. And when we are coming out of this crisis, we need new capacities, new technological skills and talents. And, and, and, and that is helping us there. And I think it was very clever. I, I think the major positive learning was that we, we invested for the, for the future. And sometimes the most difficult thing in the, in, in, in the middle of the crisis is, is cutting. Because, because you, you cannot continue spending like before. And, and you have to be able to, to understand that certain things are going to go down. Their role is going to, to go down. And you have to be able to get resources from, from those sectors and to put them in sectors which are going to go, go up. By the way, uh, one learning is, is as well that it's very difficult to, to estimate and predict what are those sectors which are going to grow? Nokia was very close to be bankrupted. And 91, late 91, owners of Nokia, main owners of Nokia, financial institutions in Finland, they were trying to sell the company to company Ericsson in Sweden. And it was so close that they succeeded to sell uh, Nokia. Even price was already agreed, but then Re Ericsson refused to take radio and television manufacturing in, in, the, in, the, in the package. And, and no one was able to predict that uh, Nokia will be such kind of fantastic uh, uh, global star within the next uh, few years. So, so and I, I think you know, even today that, that, is, that is difficult. And governments cannot do that, those pickups. Government cannot decide that this sector is growing, going to grow, this sector is not. Government has to create good environment to do that. R&D spending, education, taxation, a legal system, a regulatory system, that kind of things have to be in, in, in, in optimal, optimal condition. And we, con we concentrated into that and I think it was, it was clever as well. And finally, uh, don't worry about the next elections or in companies, uh, don't look at only the next uh, AGM or next uh, meeting with the owners. Uh, you have to trust that, that uh, on the longer term, the critical decisions, risk taking even, is going to pay back. Uh, uh, and I, I think it was necessary for us as well. We were, we were, able, to, we were able to look forward, not to look back. Mm -hmm. One other question again. Uh... I think very important for us. You know, Finland has a very special and very effective ecosystem for innovation and entrepreneurship, new ventures. So, how do you see uh, this, the new normal uh, affecting the uh, entrepreneurial spirit and the entrepreneurial ecosystem and the ventures, uh, venture investments uh, in Finland and and and also cross-border investments and also all around the world? How would that be affected? That's a, that's a very good and very important question. I. I think that what, what has been a positive trend in Finland, especially after year 2000, is the fact that uh, uh, highly educated young people have become entrepreneurs. Earlier, entrepreneurs were, were mainly those who, who didn't get good education. Now those having the best education are, all, are uh, able to become entrepreneurs as well. And we have this slush event uh, in, in Finland, biggest uh, startup event, at least in Europe, probably globally as well. Unfortunately, it, it's, it's cancelled this year because of the virus. But it, it, it's, it's a good indication what kind of movement we have been able to, to, to get. Uh, I, I think we should, we should not only look at the young people, but we, we should look at those sectors where, where people have to leave and to look at their potential to become entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurship is, is going to play a major role in, in re re recovery. And, uh, and uh, governments can do a lot in, in, in promoting uh, entrepreneurship. The Finnish system is now rather good. 
I think that uh, sometimes uh, the biggest bigger problem is that it's, it's a mental problem. So that, for example, when Nokia had to uh, had to reorganize itself 2011-2013, uh, uh, I was told I was at Nokia's leadership team that time. I was told by Nokians that no, Nokians are not entrepreneurs. They have been used to work in a in a big company, global company. They are not entrepreneurs. But when they left, and we gave them opportunity to become entrepreneurs, it was a big surprise how many of them wanted to become entrepreneurs and how many of them became successful entrepreneurs as well. So I think I think it's uh, it's very important that not only, we are not only looking at young people, young startups, but we are we are also understanding that that. Uh, uh, this transition will be much, much easier to be done if uh, education will be available. Excellent. Thank you. Well, uh, actually, since this is now a global uh, webinar, I'm trying to uh, cater for everybody. We've actually answered some of the questions, actually, uh, quite a, a, a nice summary during your talk, but also uh, I tried to address uh, questions from Turkey, from Finland. Now we have a question uh, from America, from MIT. Again, a wonderful gentleman who participated in our AI uh, conference last year today from Professor Sanjay Sarma. He's also the, the, the head of digital learning uh, for many, many years at MIT. And uh, it's a very special question. He says, would you mind naming some world leaders who have the potential to become future global leaders? What a question, huh? This is very touchy. Could be very touchy, so I leave it to you. <laughs> it's very difficult to say. Very, very uh, difficult. You should look at... Uh, what has happened in Germany? Angela Merkel, who has been prime minister already more than 10 years, she already was lame duck. So she was, she decided to leave and then the new party chairman was uh, elected and uh, no one expected that uh, she is going to play any major role anymore. And now her popularity is higher than ever and, and she is a very, very strong leader in, in so I, I think leadership in the middle of the crisis is totally different than leadership in normal times. Okay. And, uh, it's, it's not only about experience, it's about your capacity to, to lead. And yes, yes, yes. concept, concept, you have to be conscious. So I guess rather than uh, naming someone, maybe uh, it's uh, more important to uh, identify the characteristics of the leaders that is required in the new normal. Right? That's maybe that's what you. Uh, what, you're I think what I'm saying: don't look at the leaders only. Look at the population as well. I think that uh, now we have seen a lot of uh, populist movements, especially in America, in America, but many other parts of the world. I assume, I assume, and I really hope that we are returning back to. Or let's say we are not returning back, but we are moving to a new normal in that respect as well. Yes. People are getting more serious now. Yes. And we have seen first indications in Finland, for example, that, that uh, people's trust in institutions and government has increased within the last few weeks. And the reason is that people understand that we cannot live on our own. We, yes. need, to have a, we, have, we need to have a good government as well. And the same with big companies. You cannot name any single company in the world which is able to say, I don't care what, what is going on in politics. Well, from East Coast, let's move to West Coast. A uh, uh, question from uh, Professor Fritz Prince of Stanford University. This is a bit interesting too. Uh, he's originally from Europe. What are the prospects of a V-shaped recovery in Europe uh, after this corona uh, crisis? Uh, I think the critical thing is time, so that so that if if uh, recovery, uh, or let's say let's say in opposite way, if the present trend is going to be continued, I think that we we have good reasons to expect that that later this year or early next year we are starting to see economic growth again. That is optimistic view. But then there is a risk that this is going to going to stay longer. Second wave is coming and, and this is going to take longer. And then it's it's much, much more complicated and, and difficult. 
I, my suggestion and my, uh, uh, my uh, uh, let's say, thinking goes in a way that political decision makers and business decision makers have to be prepared for longer term, longer term crisis. If it's uh, coming, if the recovery is coming sooner, you will not lose anything. But if you are well prepared for the future, you, you, you, you, you, you can you can you can succeed you you can survive better so so that uh, let's say it depends on the day some day i'm more optimistic some days i'm less optimistic today i'm a bit a bit more optimistic side so i think that we have potential to recover uh, sooner than we expected a couple of weeks ago but anyway we are not there yet we, we have to see first uh, not only this healthcare recovery and uh, and economic recovery but we have to see also the social impact which is not yet clear what it is going to be tens of millions of people are employed now and uh, what is going to be the impact of that mr Aho, thank you very much time is up no. we would love to listen to you i'm sure and uh, and I'm sure, I'm sure all our participants uh, uh, join me in uh, really thanking you. Uh, that was wonderful. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'd like to end uh, with some more music, but I'm wondering, uh, you know, we've listened to Kantele, we've listened to Kanon, but uh, maybe Oud again uh, to finish off uh, with Aycan Bey, Yurdal Bey, Oğlu Attalar mı? Yes, he will. He will join in a second, Halil Bey. Okay, because I will recite, uh, with your permission, uh, Mr. Aho, again another from the way I finish with another Rumi uh, poem. Okay, uh, but we'll have some music as well. How about that? Okay. Let, let me thank first uh, before please, that. Uh, please. Let me thank for, for for you for inviting me to join, and uh, I really hope that we can we can not only have these kind of webinars, which are very nice and good, but also physically to to meet again. Yeah. Finland or in, in, in Turkey. Thank you. Well, Istanbul is a fantastic place. It's my, my favorite city in the world. So I, I'd love to, to come back there. Uh, well, we'd love, to, we'd love to have you here again. You know, we know, we know that we like you very much and you're, you are a wonderful person and I'm sure we'll have other meetings uh, to come, you know, for sure. You know? Thank you. You're Thank you. Thank you. But don't go, Mr. Aho, please. You're uh, Dajim, <laughs> Sabah Rüzgar'ına ne dersin? Hemen, hemen geliyor. <gülüyor> Yurda bir, Yurda Tokçan e, bestesi oğlu Ozan'la birlikte dinleyelim. Evet. Ben de e, kapanışlarda e, icra ettiğim Mevlana şiiriyle e, devam edelim. Ne dersin? Tamam. Haydi bakalım. Buyurun. Evet, yine Mevlana demiş ki Mevlana'nın sana verecek bir armağanı uh, Rumi said, you have no how hard I've looked for you. What is the point of bringing gold to a gold mine or a sip of water to the ocean? Everything I came up with was like taking spices to the Orient. It is not good giving my heart and soul because you already have these. So, so, look, in the mirror, look at yourself and remember me. So I'm hoping that meetings, online meetings, webinars like this, will be a mirror. So we'll remember each other and we will always remember that we are one unity. We are like one body, like one human being, and connected to each other. So, Thank you, thank you very much for being with us, for, sure, for sharing your wealth of experience. I want to thank our musicians, for me and Askine, for coming to the Bartagir, and his son Ozan. So let's listen to the tune and we'll get the final goodbye. Okay. Thank you.
çok teşekkür ediyorum. I want to thank all our group and every single participant. Uh, if we have any questions, maybe we can do it usually in the group. Well, we will definitely keep a report. Maybe if you can jot down some of the answers that we could not actually address the question, we would really appreciate that. Uh, okay. I've been receiving, uh, Mr. Howe, all those thank you notes from all over the world, you know. And I see many universities, you know, from, from Alto, from uh, the uh, Tampere, and uh, also, you know, from Carnegie Mellon University, and uh, we mentioned the MIT Stanford, and also Koch University, Bosphorus University, Istanbul Technical University. Uh, it's amazing that maybe we should really bring all these universities together in Turkey, all around the world, and also from Singapore, you mentioned and uh, and do something on education technology innovation together with uh, the industry uh, with the business what do you say Mr. Howe? absolutely I, I think that uh, we have learned to use these tools now in a in an efficient way so this is this is a new normal now instead of yes. uh, the meetings we have this these and they're getting better and better every day okay so kitos thank you very much Efendim, bütün kat katılımcılara gönülden teşekkür ediyoruz. Böyle gönülden olunca bazen dil sürçebiliyor. Eğer hatamız olduysa, bu yeni normale biz de alışıyoruz. Sürçü lisan ettiysek affola. Çok teşekkür ediyorum. Sağ olun, var olun. Her şey gönlünüzce olsun. Thank you very much. May God bless you all. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye.